right? That's exactly what I'm going to sound like. So number one, I hope to give you information you don't know. Number two is I hope the information is relevant because once again, it may be something you don't know, but if you don't care about it and it doesn't do anything for you, then why would you want to listen to me? So those are my two goals. Um, we're going to talk today on a variety. The subject is interoperative perioperative hypothermia. Um, we're going to be covering several different aspects of it. So some of it may seem off track, but I promise you I'll bring it all back and make it relevant, okay? Well, where did this all start? Well, way back in the 1990s, what? This is what we're going to go over. Sorry, market changes, the hypothermia itself, looking at temperature management, looking at methods of warming, and then finally looking, drilling down a little bit on the irrigation warming, and I'll get to the reason for that in a moment. So, where did this all start? Well, way back into the 1990s, those old of us here, old enough to remember it, old enough to remember it, researchers started looking at patients who were becoming hypothermic. Up until this point, nobody had looked at any relationship between patient temperatures and clinical outcomes. Well, what they found were some pretty startling numbers. Number one is 60 to 90 percent of all surgical patients were becoming clinically hypothermic. And out of those patients who were becoming hypothermic, there were actually a lot of negative outcomes. It tripled the incidence of surgical site infections, which we're going to drill into a little bit. It increased uh, the incidence of surgical blood loss by up to 14 percent. It increased the duration of post-anesthesia care by up to 20 percent. It also increased the incidence of morbid cardiac outcomes. Uh, by the way, this is going to be a little interactive this morning, so I'm going to be asking some questions and hopefully somebody will shout out an answer. Uh, does anybody have any idea how long it takes from basic research being done until it becomes a change in practice inside of the clinical setting? Five years. Five years over here. Do I have any other numbers? Ten? Even if I added a vote together, it wouldn't be correct. The correct number is 17 years. Why is that? What's the one thing in life we all hate? Change. Yeah. I actually asked that question. I had a, a woman in the audience at one of the hospitals shout out my husband, and I, I didn't think that was quite right. <laughs> but you're right. We all hate change, right? What's the one thing that we know is going to happen today and tomorrow? Is change. But we all push back on change because we get comfortable, right? We don't want to have to do new things. Man, I'm good at what I do now. Why do I have to learn something else? But it is always evolving. For those of us old enough to remember, um, I actually worked with uh, Dr. Barry out of Atlanta, Georgia, who was the person, uh, the doctor who invented the lap Coley surgical procedure. Up until that time, all the gallbladders were removed open. When was the last time someone in here saw an open gallbladder that was a scheduled gallbladder? Right? There would be one person in the audience. But 20 years ago, nobody had ever thought about doing them laparoscopically. So things change. There are equipment that I sold um, 20 years ago that don't exist anymore in the marketplace because of change. Well, let's look at the, we're going to drill down in a little bit into hospital acquired infections. Remember, surgical site infections go up for patients who are cold. 17% um, of all healthcare acquired infections are surgical site infections, estimated at 500,000 a year. The length of stay associated with surgical site infections can increase from 4 to 14 days. The cost is estimated between $3,518,000 per surgical site infection, and the direct and indirect cost from surgical site infection to the healthcare system in the United States is $10 billion a year. Patients who become hypothermic have tripled the incidence of surgical site infections. And the reason this has become important, we'll get into a little more. Well, in 2002, remember the research started in the 1990s, right? And in 2002, there were a whole bunch of organizations led by CMS. Uh, there were 10 of them to start with. And they said, you know what? We need to find better ways to reduce the cost and the incidence of hospital-acquired infections, including surgical site infections. Um, way back when, they started with something called SIP, which was a Surgical Infection Prevention Program. They identified three states. They said, we have clinical evidence that we want to implement this evidence to see if we can generate better clinical outcomes. Lo and behold, in those three states, they had a lower rate of surgical site infections. So out of that, they came out with the SKIP, the Surgical Care Improvement Project. Um, I don't know how much you guys have direct or indirect responsibility in these areas, but this has become a very um, top-heavy, paperwork-driven 
reporting process to help hopefully lower the rate of surgical site infections. Um, does anybody remember the 100,000 Lives campaign from the early 2000s? I usually get one or two people. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement came out and said that there were 100,000 people dying every year in hospitals from preventable mistakes. And they wanted to publicize this and say, we want to lower that number from the 100,000. We, we'd love to eliminate, but we want to lower it. Well, um, after five years, in 2007, they went back and re-addressed uh, the 100,000 lives. Now, um, understanding that change takes time, does anybody want to guess how much of a reduction they saw in five years of working on this? And I will say the cynics in the room are going to be pretty close. Any guesses? Actually, the number went up. <laughs> because change is hard, it takes time. Um, as time rolled on, the Joint Commission got involved. They started mandating and reducing hospital acquired infections. In 06, it became part of the Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goals. SCIP is one of the five core measures that hospitals can report to the Joint Commission on um, uh, their tracking and maintaining the numbers and maintaining normothermia as part of the original SCIP protocol for reducing surgical site infections. Um, the reason that, that we go into this part and I talk about this is to try to give everybody a perspective of how big of an issue temperature management is and who the outside forces are that are looking at the temperature management issue because the temperature management is part of that SCIP protocol. Well, pay for performance, okay? In 2008, CMS, the single largest payer of healthcare, came out and said, you know what, we're going to change the rules for hospitals. We're going to try to get their attention. And what they said is that they were going to cease Medicare reimbursement for care associated with hospital-acquired infections, healthcare-acquired infections, including SSIs, that they deemed preventable. The private insurance companies are now following suit. To give you a perspective of what this is from a dollar standpoint, University of Michigan, um, and I know you guys are from all across the state, University of Michigan is roughly the size of a hospital of, of a Vanderbilt or a University of Tennessee. They looked at this one single rule change, not all the rest they proposed, but just this one. They went back and did a retrospective on their patients from their hospital, and they determined that they were going to lose in excess of $15 million a year in reimbursement for care they were going to provide. So the administrators of your hospitals, the CEOs, the CFOs, telling them that they're going to lose this kind of money and that care is still going to have to be given, this is the reason that this one topic continues to drive interest uh, because there's so much money involved. And the hospitals, one-third of all hospitals in this country are making money, one-third of all hospitals in this country are breaking even, and one-third of all hospitals in this country are losing money. I manage, personally, I manage from Virginia to Maine, the Northeast. Um, there are 10 hospitals in the borough of Brooklyn. Half of them are currently scheduled to be closed within the next 12 months, and possibly the other half as well. To give you guys an idea, you're right here in the middle, the customer, right? Look at all the people who you have putting pressure on you. Oh, I'll step over here. The federal regulatories, national patient safety goals, accreditation, patient physician satisfaction, internal metrics, okay, state legislatures, the guidelines, professional associations, consumer advocacy groups, the consumers themselves. I mean, that's a lot of pressure on hospitals. That's a lot. Well, let's talk about patients getting cold, hypothermia itself. These next three or four slides to me are, are really interesting because as I've presented this and talked to people, the information on the next three si slides are, is information that almost nobody knows and it really is the root cause of patients becoming cold. Well first, what is hypothermia? It's a core temperature of 36 degrees Celsius or below. That's one degree below normal. What's actually causing it? Let's look at what's happening to the patients. So number one, the patient's age. Pediatric and geriatric, they either have not developed or they have lost the ability to produce, manage, and control heat production and heat loss. Who gets the majority of surgeries in this country? What age group? Geriatric, right? 
Before they come into your hospital tomorrow morning, what is the preoperative nurse going to tell them to do today? What do they have to stop doing? They, they go APO, right? No food, no drink. Well, guess what our body uses food and drink for? One of the things that you need to choose for? Heat production. So today, for your patients tomorrow, they're having their fuel supply turned off to their furnace. Fuel supply is gone. There's something wrong with them or they wouldn't be coming in the hospital in the first place, right? For those of us who've had surgery in here, what happens? Tomorrow morning, I'm coming to one of your hospitals. What's the first thing they're going to get me to do? They're going to strip me down and give me that beautiful, right? That all that is so attractive, right? So I've lost a thermal barrier. I've had my fuel supply turned off. I've lost a thermal barrier. There's something wrong with me, and I'm probably old, right? And and, and to, to bring that point home on the old people and, and uh, thermal regulation, has anybody ever been to Florida in August and seen somebody outside in a sweater, right? What was their age? They're the ones getting the surgery. So they give me this beautiful gown, and then what's the next thing they do? Get the cold fluids. Okay, they put the ID in. Every bag of room temperature ID fluid that is given to a patient lowers their core temperature by a quarter degree Celsius. Okay? They roll them down, then what happens? Put us on the gurney, roll us down into your nice warm OR, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, anesthesia, the single greatest assault on temperature. We're going to get to that in the next slide. Understand that a little better. Opening up a large body cavity, major fluid or blood loss, and then large volumes of irrigation. If you look at this list of clinical causes of patients becoming hypothermic, how many can you, at the clinical level, really address? Not going to change their age, not going to change what's wrong with them, not going to change that uh, uh, they haven't had any food, okay? Fluid, IVs, and cold fluids and blood, yes. Cold OR environment. I'm sure some of you would like that to change, right? Um, anesthesia, nope. Body cavity, major fluid blood, blood loss, and large volume of irrigation. So out of that group of nine, two and a half, maybe? IV irrigation and room temperature. Body cold with a warm blanket. Pardon? Body cold with a warm blanket. You're gonna raise your body temperature. We're gonna get to the warm blanket in just a, uh, just a moment. <laughs> What happens next? This is how a patient becomes cold. All of us in the room are over here on the left, okay? The left of that screen, we have a core temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, all of us right here. Now, if I took a, a thermometer and stabbed myself in the leg and looked at it, the muscle, the bone, the skin, number one, it would hurt a lot, but number two, it would not be 37 degrees. The body keeps a totally different temperature from the core to the periphery. And the challenges that are occurring to the patient on the previous slide, having their uh, fuel turned off, um, having the thermal barrier removed, something's wrong with them, putting cold fluids in, it actually does not affect a conscious patient in their core temperature. But what it will do is it will lower the peripheral temperature. People coming into the ER in the middle of winter in Michigan, They've been outside, their exposure. What's frozen on them? Right? They don't come in with a frozen lung because the body's willing to sacrifice the arms, the legs, if it can maintain the core. So it's designed to maintain it. Well, when the patient is anesthetized, and I'm a big fan of this because I've had a few surgeries, um, a little part of the middle of the brain called the hypothalamus, going back to anatomy physiology 101, it goes to sleep. When the hypothalamus goes to sleep, it removes the control mechanism to maintain the two separate compartments of heat. Think about coming home in the middle of winter to your house and walking in and making the following two decisions. Number one, I'm going to walk over my wall and I'm going to turn off my thermostat. And then, number two, is I'm going to go open up my doors and my windows. Because when the hypothalamus goes to sleep, the ability of vasoconstriction collapses. And the ability to produce heat stops. Because the hypothalamus controls both functions. So right now, when that person is anesthetized, 
Their doors and windows are open and their thermostat is turned off. The heat